You know, you might think that The Tick is nothing more than a ridiculously fun superhero parody, but on Cartoon Commotion, we're gonna look beyond the obvious and take the path much less traveled. Join the commotion right after this. Let's go back in time, we can just hit rewind. What a terrific notion, it's Cartoon Commotion! Hi, friends! I'm Cade, and this is my pet pig, Jiggy. <coughs> Together, we rewind to the tunes of the good old days for a new perspective nowadays, analyzing this classic artistry to give you a brand new experience in your life today. If at any time you feel like you're digging the show, there are buttons to help you like and share this podcast. Both are free ways that you can show us some love and support, because we make this show for you, Commotion Crew. And just in case you forgot, this show is brought to you by the fine people of the Serial Box Network. Ta-da! Joining us in this episode is our special guest, Dan Rosales of Rosales Comics, a writer, director, animator, podcaster, and filmmaker who's currently working on his own original comics. Everyone, please drop a mondo huge hiya for Dan in the chat. Hiya, Dan! Good evening, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. And live chat friends, you can be part of this conversation. We'll bring your comments up on screen just like this one. Tack the artist cat says it's coming. And that's that's like where he's like, it's it, the anticipation is building. The live stream is almost well, it's here now, Tack. Are you here? Tack? Hello? And Dave Mattingly says, Howdy Dan. Howdy, Dave. Thanks for being here, Dave. Jiggy and I will get back to you if you're not here live. If you're listening to the audio version of the podcast, the way you interact with us live is either on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. You can find the live streams under Cartoon Commotion. And there are some more. There's, Tack is here again. I am drawing, he says. Good to see you, Tack. I'm glad you're still here, and I'm. Uh, it's fun to draw while you're listening to live streams. That's, that's fun. Okay. So, we'll come back to the live chat in a little bit. Right now, we've got to do the breakdown. And for that, we need breakdown music. The Tick was created by Ben Edlin. First in comics in 1986, then in an animated series for Fox Kids in 1994, it aired a total of three seasons. 36 episodes from September 10th to November 24th, 1996. In this version of The Tick, he entered a contest and was sent to be the champion of the city, meeting Arthur, who was just fired from his job as an accountant for his side pursuit of becoming a superhero. This adaptation remains faithful to the source material while playing on the strengths of animation by leaning into the identity of a Saturday morning cartoon, with The Tick even giving us all ridiculous monologue of morality at the end of every adventure. Now, Jiggy has a special message for us. <coughs> Friends, prepare yourselves, because this is our main topic. Our main topic for this episode is... Hug your destiny, Arthur! Hug it! Destiny and the unconventional path. Dan... Do you have that echo effect you had earlier? I do, and I'm glad to use it, if especially to read Jared Frost's uh, uh, comment there. Spoon! Spoon! Jared Frost says, I'll be listening and lurking, but first, Spoon. You can go ahead and say it again, Dan. Spoon! I love it. Dave Mattingly says, I love... I love Tick as the comic, the cartoon, the Patrick Warburton live action, and the stage play. Yes, he he did mention there was a stage play, and I have yet to look into that, because I've been kind of absorbed in the animated series recently. <laughs> um, alrighty, so before we get into that main topic too deeply, Dan, I've got to ask, you are a comic guy. Have you read the original Ben Edlin Tick comics? 
Oh, absolutely. I was, uh, it, it's an amazing thing. You don't realize when you're back in the eighties, uh, when you're, when you're looking at an independent comic book, just where it comes from. And NEC at that time was new England comics. It was a comic book store and, uh, uh, ben Edlin worked at that store, so he drew their mascot for their uh, fanzine that they sent out to all of their comic collectors locally. Uh, no real internet to speak of at that point. So that was the way they got the word out, and they used that as a, as a way of gaining attention. Well, it gained in popularity, so they wound up printing up the comic books and soliciting them nationwide and actually worldwide through Diamond Comic Publishers. And so that's how I found them is in my own local comic shop, but it came from another comic shop at the time. So, I mean, it's, it's really, really just kind of a lightning strike how uh, the tick got out to the world. And uh, it was, it was, it was very, very just, it, the first ones were in black and white and then they started reprinting them in color. And it was just, it took off from there. That is radical. I mean, I, I have the Edlin reprint, but you were there at the cusp of it. You were there when it came out. That is that is a nice story. <laughs> I like that a lot. Because <laughs> it feels like uh, in the moment, very in the moment when you first discovered it, like it, right there when it happened. That's awesome. Uh, my favorite moment in those comics was the issue where the tick woke up in the middle of the night with an unexplainable desire for Pez. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just so random and strange, but I really dig it. So for that reason, my tick figure that I have in box has packages of Pez on top of it. Just random little cartridge, you know, the cartridges you'd slide into the Pez dispenser. Mm -hmm. I, I have like mm -hmm. some orange and yellows just sitting right on top of the figure for no, just because <laughs> I, I know it's weird, <laughs> but it just feels right to me. So, um, yeah, that's my experience. Do you have a favorite comic moment that you can remember? Well, I always like the little additions at the back of the comic book. The original comic books had uh, uh, brochures uh, that uh, uh, talked about a, a a ninja theme park that was a lot like Disneyland, and it it, it talked to talked it up and used it and it expanded on the characters within the comic books and the whole situation with the ninjas that he had. I remember so that. Those were, those were uh, uh, really just side asides from what was going on. And they just added so much to the comic book. It's kind of like world building outside of the comic a little bit because they were like real brochures. Yeah. Yes. That's, a, that's a lot of fun. I love it when they can tie in like material like that, you know, to make it feel a little bit more lifelike. Just just bring their world a little bit more into our world. That's a lot of fun. Alrighty then. So getting back on track here, I was rewatching the Tick cartoon for this live stream, of course, and I saw it differently this time around. I discovered a sincerely deeper value within this fantastical superhero satire. Do you have any clue what I could possibly be talking about, Dan? Well, uh, I, I think a lot of people get different things in uh, in second viewings uh, of different things from when they were a child and uh, or the, or younger, depending on how what the case may be. Because uh, I know the uh, the the tick, uh, I, I believe. The, the first episode was back in September 1994. So uh, the eighties had the comic books and then uh, uh, the cartoon debuted in, in 94. So that's right. What you look at the way you look at the world now in uh, 2023 versus 1994 has got <laughs> to open up a lot of, a uh, lot of different things uh, to interpretation. Yeah. You see, I, I see all of these things as art pieces. So like everything has a way like you can interpret it a little bit deeper each time you go back and revisit it and you know media is designed to be introspective so like you can connect with the character and you can see some part of yourself in there and and pull a little tidbit of information and in this i mean i thought i honestly thought i couldn't possibly find something sincerely deep about this show because it's just, it's a fun satire there's nothing seriously deep about it and it doesn't have to be but <laughs> i did i did i found something that i just it fascinates me because i feel i find it relatable i find it mildly no actually truly relatable um 
In the first episode, The Idea Men, before Arthur first meets the Tick, he's working in an office building as an accountant. He's fired because he's wearing what his boss calls a bunny outfit, which he'll often correct during the show, explaining that he's dressed as a moth. And here I have a screenshot of Arthur at his desk. I call this screenshot of Arthur, dress for the job you want, not the one you have. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I feel like everyone's seen that meme at least once. Um, can, can you feel at all for Arthur's situation here, Dan? Oh, absolutely. Um, there he is. He's doing the thing he's been trained to do. Obviously, you just don't become an accountant. Uh, you go through an entire process to find yourself there to be an accountant. Mm -hmm. But when you find yourself in a job that uh, uh, does not fulfill your needs, then you start looking for something else uh, to, to do so. And Arthur find get, getting a hold of this suit um i'm not sure if they they clarified how he got the suit but he had the suit and it just called to him and, and very much so i think the suit i think it has uh different interpret like there's di variations on the origin of the suit and I, I like in the tick how they don't necessarily need an origin for everything it's very humorously just there <laughs> And you just have to accept it as a part of reality, and that that's part of the fun of the tick. But in this case, uh, with Arthur, there's you know there's variations. I think in this, it might have come from aliens. If I remember down the road, there was like this sort of like alien story where I I can't I gotta go back and rewatch that episode. But I think that was in season two, and um, <laughs> and then there was you know in in the variation the first live action. I think he found it. Uh, it, basically every version he comes across a suit or he's blessed with this suit randomly and he just, you know, it, it kind of, like you said, calls to him. I think at the latest adaptation for Amazon, it was sort of just a, uh, uh, like the tick kept bringing it back to him, something like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in the first two variations, it, you know the co uh, the first live action in the in the cartoon and the comic book, uh, those were all just him deciding like this. And I, I like the story a lot because I think the the way I'm interpreting this is that it's an excellent illustration of the side hustle mentality, chasing your dreams even when others consider it actually crazy or stupid. Um, and I think Jiggy wanted to add something here about Arthur and his job, too. What you got for us, buddy? Okay. Well said. Well said. I know, right? He's <laughs> he's really skilled when it comes to making a point. Uh, Jiggy is so totally right on the money with this. Arthur doesn't want to take... Uh, no, sorry. Arthur doesn't take being fired as a bad thing, really. He expresses a new sense of freedom from the path that he was stuck on, admitting that he couldn't live this life a moment longer, while the road much less traveled is much more exciting than taxes. <laughs> uh, you know, as comedic as this show is, I could relate to this concept, because, you know, I've had a regular job, and I've, I'm taking a path that's much less traveled. Chat friends, feel free to join us in the comments. Have you ever felt trapped in the mundane? Let's see. Chat friends, what are we saying? Um, Tack the Artist Cat says, the Tick VA played an Autobot one time. Yeah, in uh, Transformers Animated, he played Ultra Prim uh, Primus? Or... You're going to have to correct me on that, Tack. I, it's been a minute. Um... Dave Mattingly says, "Move along, we're a hedge <laughs> to the the ninjas, because they they did that. Um, they like put on hedge costumes." Dave Mattingly says, "As I recall, Ben first created the Tick in a Marvel RPG game. That's interesting. We're gonna have to look into that. Um, unless you know more about that, Dan." I have not heard that until just now. So Dave is the master of the tick, and we're going to lean into his wisdom. Odd Pod says, just popping in to say, hi, love the tick. Hiya, Odd Pod. Good to see you. 
Uh, Tax says Townsend Coleman plays both the tick. Oh, Sentinel Prime. There we go. That's it. Sentinel Prime and Transformers Animated. You know, that's an underrated show, ladies and gentlemen. That is underrated. That is something you you, you might want to check out if you haven't. Uh, Dave Manningly says in the live action, I think he built the suit. Oh, yes, right. He hadn't tested it. That's right. But it was still the same premise of like putting on the suit and wanting that life. And so so it's a similar situation. B Mr. B Man says every superhero in the tick is unusual. That is not true. Um, that is okay. Yep, that is true. Dave Manningly says the mundane holds no sway over my life. There you go. There's a response. The mundane the holds no sway over my life. There you go. Can you say something about <laughs> destiny in that tick voice? Ah, uh, ooh, ooh. Destiny Maybe. calls me. And her sweet call be beckons me to leap from the rooftops. <laughs> Destiny calls. Wait, oh, that's a little too deep. I, I, I can't nail it every single time. <laughs> I haven't had to practice with that. No pressure. We're only But live. I'll do what I can. <laughs> okay, so we got we to gotta try to move on. <laughs> you just work on that, okay? Sure. <laughs> um. So I think that in this sense, we're um, we're out of place, or the longing for something that we feel like we're called to is something every human uh, deals with in time. Even though an unconventional path isn't for everyone, I think those of us who feel drawn to the unconventional shouldn't just suppress that for the sake of the simple lives that we've become accustomed to, or in Arthur's case, have trained for and and just accepted. Am I right? I feel like I feel like I am in this case. Uh, in this first episode, Arthur says, uh, "I got to get back to Arthur here." There's a that screenshot of Arthur. There we go. Arthur says that adventure and destiny are waiting for him. With hilariously perfect timing, he leaves the office, and the tick falls into the road ahead of him. All right, and here we got a screenshot of the tick who jumped off a building, grabbed a flagpole, and just crash lands into the pavement. Um, <laughs> or asphalt. I'm sure that the tick represents... Okay, okay, so here's the, here's the kicker. I'm sure that the tick represents Arthur's destiny in this cartoon series. Because even though the tick speaks of destiny often, it makes sense to me. Because when Arthur was doubting himself for the first time, he thinks he's going crazy, and the tick sets him right. He says, you're going sane in a crazy world, Arthur. Hug your destiny. That's where we get the title of this <laughs> podcast here today. Hug your destiny, Arthur. Reach out and hug it! Which is a much weirder way of saying, embrace your destiny. Uh, what do you think... Of the tick in this series representing Arthur's destiny, Dan. Any anything to add to that? No, I think that's a that's a perfect call because if Arthur had waited just a few moments or had left just a few moments earlier, he would have missed the encounter with the tick. So definitely, uh, tick is his destiny. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, the the play on the superhero aspect of it as the tick dives down. He grabs hold of uh, of the flagpole. Now, any other superhero would have landed on it, would have uh, uh, swung bounced off, off of it. it, bounced off of it, or whatever. But because uh, the tick is uh, uh, slightly a parody of these uh, these tropes, the <laughs> flagpole breaks. But not just, only does I'm it break. I'm looking at the screenshot and I'm laughing because I could I understand what you're. He's like 99% muscle. <laughs> and and the uh, not only does it just stay in his hand, but it continues to wobble because of the impact that he had <laughs> in the ground. And he like and tosses it away. Yeah, the, in the comic book, when he lands, he lands in the into the street, not on top of the street. Doesn't just crack it. He he goes into the street, and again, in you know, just to see the words wobble, wobble, wobble on the page. <laughs> It was hilarious. That is hilarious because it's the description, it, it, and they represent that so perfectly in the cartoon. They really do. I, I feel like the cartoon did a really good job of translating what happened in the comics to the screen, giving us this uh, immersive animated environment that feels like, it, you know, I mean, I enjoyed the Warburton show. I did. But I feel like, and this was how it was described to me by uh, 
Jared uh, Bricky, also known as Jared Frost here in the chat, he said it was kind of like Seinfeld meets superheroes, and that's kind of what they were going for, and I, and I can understand that. But at the same time, this this gave us that, like, comic book world to operate in, you know, and I think that the live action shows didn't really, they, they couldn't really accomplish that. I'm not sure if it was budget or what, but there was just some things that the animated series has way over the live action in the world that they're operating in, like the wobble wobble flagpole is mm -hmm. exactly right because they, they can translate even the most basic comic book actions to an animated universe. You know, and the fact that uh, Arthur, uh, let, let, let's ignore the fact that he's wearing a moth costume and that <laughs> he, he wants to be a superhero. He represents uh, the general public watching the show. And we can clearly put ourselves in that suit because of the things that he feels on the inside. And, you know, if you look at it from the perspective uh, that uh, this show is all about destiny and embracing that destiny, uh, Arthur becomes the main character, not the tick. The tick is a way to facilitate uh, Arthur's destiny. Indeed. He goes outside and hits the streets because he's no longer going to be trapped within the walls in the cubicle of, of this nine to five life. He wants to be a superhero. So what happens? Bam, a superhero falls into his life and embraces him as his sidekick. The so. moment that he accepts that that's not the life for him anymore. Because, like, he gave him the opportunity. He's like, we got to let you go. Uh, but they, you know, in, in the Warburton show, the first live action show, they actually gave him the ultimatum of staying. They said you could stay. And I feel mm -hmm. like that could have, you know, they just didn't go into it here. But he could have stayed. But because this isn't really the life he wanted, that's not the life he pursued. And I think you're dead on there, man, right on. Because that's I love that you broke it down like that because that's exactly what I was going for. So this is another screenshot of them drinking coffee together after they first meet. And this interaction was <laughs> hilarious. But I just wanted to put that on there to reinforce the idea of the tick being Arthur's destiny moving forward. Fast forward to episode three, Dinosaur Neil. Uh, we have a screenshot of them trying to stop Dinosaur Neil up there. And the, he's flying into his face and the tick's climbing on his shoulder. Dinosaur Neil, like, um, let, me, let me break this down. A uh, paleontologist named Neil accidentally swallows a mutated dino organism and becomes a Zilla-sized version of himself with a dino-sized hunger for the destruction of the city. The subplot was about Arthur's sister, Dot. Now, th this is why this is a part of this whole arc that I'm bringing up here. She completely disapproved of his and the Tick's superhero life. And while she's over eating dinner with them, Dinosaur Neil is wreaking havoc. Let's go back to Dinosaur Neil picture right there. Look at that. He's wreaking havoc on the city. And she's not allowing them, it's almost comedically not allowing them to, you know, in an ignorant way, to go out and stop him from destroying the city that surrounds them. <laughs> but with no other heroes willing to step up and stop him, the two of them were their only hope. So Arthur stood up and took off with the tick anyways. And it was Arthur who came up with the plan to use an oversized aspirin, yeah, to stop the <laughs> mutation of Neil. And a reporter revealed the whole situation. This is her, Sally Vacuum. <laughs> uh, she repu uh, reported the whole situation to Dot, in a sense, on TV at the apartment saying that their heroic effort was the most selfless act that she had ever witnessed. And Dot sort of warmed up to them being superheroes after that. You see... Yes, but she wouldn't do the dishes. No, she would not do the dishes. You're right. <laughs> You're right. She, she did make that a point to say that I'm still not doing the dishes. Uh, you see, I think that there will always be people who can't see the vision of the dream that you have. People who care or um or people who don't who need a bit more convincing of the good you can accomplish when you go out there and make it happen um you feeling that dan yeah i think uh, um 
the the way that it all played out uh again going back to destiny or not just manifest destiny but just destiny all, all together because the uh, uh the superheroes bowed out they said they were going to let the national guard take uh, take care of it the That's national true. guard uh, said they weren't going to get involved unless the creature was officially uh rampaging so everybody <laughs> yeah. was bowing out you know yeah and, like the mayor was on the phone it's like okay it is ramp because it hit like a water tower and you know because they mm -hmm. weren't going to come unless it was genuinely rampaging that and was what great. they brought, what they brought was just a giant pair of pants. Like that was going to fix everything. <laughs> and I remember so the scientist was like, those are the largest trousers I have ever seen. <laughs> and then when the lightning strikes him, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> oh, the best puns. The best Take puns. Him. Bring him to the trousers. <laughs> But back on back on topic here, um, you were saying about destiny. I mean, he uh, he did his best to avoid uh, the destiny of being the superhero, uh, trying to please those around him as opposed to living his true self. Uh, even so much as seeing across from him how much it was bothering the tick to not do so. He continued uh, to try to heal the relationship with his sister, his sister, who really early on uh, told him straight to his face. Dad really messed you up, didn't he? Oh, <laughs> Which kind of gives them, uh, that, you know, that, that initial that, reaction was just like, I cannot believe <laughs> you just said that. <laughs> but so yeah. He, you know, it, it seems like everything in his life, including his dad, was build him, building him up to this point, and he, he was still continuing to look for the affirmation of the people in his life. And once he was able to, to break past that and make that decision that they're going to do it and save the city, uh, then he was freed to do so. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's like very very empowering that he was able to be himself despite uh, uh all the things that were surrounding him that was pushing him away from it like peer pressure saying like you can't you can't be that that's insane <laughs> and you know i mean within context within reason it like in reality it's insane but within the concept of the show there's loads of superheroes in the city there's loads of these you know people living these lifestyles so for for this it was not it was not insane it was something that very many characters were pursuing on their own and he saw that there was a need because nobody else would step up so I'm now yeah, he wasn't I'm the you. only one, though. He was not the only one to act. I mean, you got to give credit to uh, uh, the bullet, the human bullet, the yes. human bullet. Fire me, boy. He, that's right. He <laughs> was sitting there eating hot dogs in the yard with his family, but he was suited up and ready to go at a moment's notice. When he saw the Mas National Guard uh, flying overhead, it looks like the city needs me. Fire me, boy. <laughs> and he takes off, jumps into his cannon. And uh, uh, hits the uh, um, hits the uh, dinosaur Neil right in the right in the belly, just in time to spit Tick out. I think because Tick climbed into his mouth with that giant aspirin. I think, yes, and then yes. he had to like, oh no no, he upchucked the aspirin and he had to throw it back down his throat. That's right. Yeah, but... wrestled the tongue. <laughs> That was an ordeal. <laughs> I I remember I was like partially cringing as I'm watching that tongue get choked. <laughs> like you can't even choke a tongue, so physics, whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it does seem. Um, it seems that there is something that Jiggy wants to talk about now. Yeah, but buddy, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, he he kind of wants to go a little off topic here for a minute, just just for a minute. Uh, his favorite parts were the creative parodies of other comics like Tick, Dick Tracy with Chairface Chippendale. Uh, I remember that in the original comic books, and uh, we both think that that was perfectly translated to the cartoon, both Jiggy and I do. Do you have... Any favorite episodes or moments right now that you'd like to mention, Dan? 
Well, in the comic book, uh, he ran across the uh, Clark Kent equivalent, and he could see right through his his costume of the glasses, <laughs> right. which uh, um, which drove him crazy because nobody else knew, and the glasses worked, which was kind of a revelation to the Tick because he decided he was going to have a an alter ego as well, so he put on a tie as a costume, and. To uh, the Clark equivalent surprise, it, it worked, and he uh, got a job at the newspaper, and kept trying to be chums with him, and and try to talk superhero stuff on the sly, and it was really getting under the, the Superman uh, doppelganger's nerve. So uh, that was uh, that to me was pretty uh, pretty inspiring, actually. Uh, you know, <laughs> for a comic to do something like that, I'd never seen anything like that before. Now, in the cartoon, the um, Superman equivalent had a really hard time because he he was constantly trying to change into his costume, but he could never find a place to change. He couldn't run mm-hmm. into the bathroom. He couldn't run into the phone booth. It was just he, he was not capable of getting into his costume no matter what happened. <laughs> and it's almost it's almost ridiculous at that point because it's like if you have the power to help, but the only thing in between you and saving the world is your secret identity, just like. Just, just toss it, man. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> At this point, you know, because like the only thing that was keeping him from doing anything was the costume. He just had to change suits, and then he could save the day. But even he kind of, you know, took it to the side and didn't do anything when disaster struck. And I think that's really the the greatest strength of Tick and Arthur is that. When everyone else is sitting it out, they step up to the plate and they fight crime. Um, so, those are great moments indeed. Continuing our talk of parodies and getting a little bit back on topic, one superhero character who also had to warm up to the Tick and Arthur was American Maid. A female Captain America sort with a great pun for a name. <laughs> she was a fantastic <laughs> character, mostly. Uh, with far more experience as a superhero than our guys had. Uh, it was a struggle for her to give them a chance in the Chairface episode, but she was glad that she did in the end. I loved their recurring, reoccurring team-ups. Like, they were all super friends. You know you know about that? How how you feel about that, Dan? <laughs> I think it's great. Uh, you know, you take Wonder Woman and Captain America and you put them together, and that is a great uh, TV uh, analogous to what they had in the comic books, which was a little bit different. Uh, I think her name was Oedipus Rex, and it was more of an Electra knockoff than it was. Uh, but uh, she, both characters bantered back and forth with the uh, Deflator Mouse, which is the Batman version. And we do and, have uh, uh, a picture of those two arguing yeah. in the very it's, first it's, episode. <laughs> <laughs> very, very apparent that they had a relationship <laughs> that makes like, it hard for them to work together. It's like, I'm so, not having it. <laughs> but, you know, you got to do something different for uh, kids and you've got to change some of the stories. So uh, in doing so, uh, they've created uh, uh, American Made, which, uh, you know, they changed for the live action series as well. You are breaking in and out every now and then, so I was just wondering if uh, if that's going on. Chat, can you chime in if Dan is breaking in, uh, breaking out, uh, break, <laughs> breaking out, breaking up a lot? Please let me know in the chat if you're here. Uh, okay, so moving on. Uh, it did seem to me like with American Made here that they were constantly having to prove themselves as heroes. And while the show and the comics didn't really have a serious arc, this was a running theme also that they faced. I found it incredibly relatable as one who also chose an unconventional road. So Dan, have you ever found yourself in a spot where you felt like you had to prove yourself as a creative? Um, yeah, when I started doing comic books in the 80s, um, it's uh, comic books itself is a very very um, clannish uh, type of uh, of uh, industry. Um, it's uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've uh, ever experienced this or not, but there are certain industries where you go where it's who you know more than what you know, 
and whether or not you know business more than art. So excuse me. Um, going into it uh, in the 80s, I didn't have much business acumen. I didn't have much skill as an artist either. So I had two strikes against me and I didn't know a whole lot of people. Um, so very much you feel like an outsider trying to get in when you when you come to comic books, uh, because there's there's a way to do things and <laughs> there's a uh, um, there's people you need to know in order to get things done. So uh, definitely. Uh, I've felt that just getting, you know, your foot in the door and getting known. It's a lot. It's a lot when you're getting started, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jared Frost. We're going to jump into the chat here. Jared Frost. Hi, Jared. He says, here you go. Destiny is sweet. Frothy cream in the steamy hot cup of life. Chum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That it is the great tick quote right there. And Dave Mattingly says, Gravity is a harsh mistress. Wub, 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 wub. <laughs> uh, Tack the artist cat says the tick and freakazoid would make um, would they make good friends or enemies? Um, neither. <laughs> they would they would make neither in my opinion. Uh, the tick and freakazoid have very different comedic personalities. Freakazoid is incredibly self aware, where the tick is like completely in uh, embodying uh embodying the identity of a superhero not not knowing like people are watching him think you know the most they do in the tick cartoon is the tick will turn to the camera and he'll give that moral message but it'll be in the sense that he's doing it for everyone around him not necessarily for the tv uh, in the first episode, he does turn to the camera and say, you know, this is the start of the adventures of Tick. And then he pulls Arthur in there and, and Arthur's like, and Arthur, his sidekick. And it's essentially just like a proclamation of their team up for the first time, not necessarily that they're addressing the camera. So um, whereas Freakazoid would literally stop the show and start talking to someone on set. Like there's there's a huge difference in that humor style. So I don't think they'd really be friends or enemies. I think they just know of each other's existence and be okay with it. Uh Sherry Edgen says, yo, 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 cartoon commotion, checking in. How you doing, Sherry Edgen? And uh Tack the Artist Cat says, I can hear him fine. So nobody's having any issue hearing you in the chat, Dan. That's good. I might just be on my end then. Uh, Sherry Edgen says, the tick is a weirdo, but it works. Where's Jiggy Jiggy? <laughs> well, he's been here a lot. You'll have to rewind, but he'll, he'll probably come in again. Uh, Sherry Edgen says, cartoon con commotion, top-notch cartoon history. Well, thank you. It's It's more of a... You know, an introspective, uh, retrospective sort of thing. But, yeah, there's history involved. <laughs> okay, so, uh, before we continue, <laughs> we do have a message from Jiggy. So, Sherry Edgen, here you go. If you're enjoying this live stream, Jiggy's here to remind you to hit like. It helps other people just like you find our videos. Okay, so there's some Jiggy for you. Thank you, Jiggy, for that message. If you're here in the live stream or you're listening to the replay, please click like or share. Those things help get the message of this podcast existence out there into the world. It would be very cool of you. Okay, so the arc thread of the unconventional continues into episode four, where the tick is put under a... You know, it's, it's a hypnosis by Mr. Mental. Tick, though his mind may be a guazillion times weaker than his body, was still fighting to resist Mr. Mental's control. And during this struggle, Mr. Mental freed the Tick's worst nightmare. <laughs> and um, that just so happened to be a normal desk job in an office. <laughs> Uh, paperwork started piling up on his desk. He was typing frantically on an old school typewriter. You know, nowadays, I doubt many young folks will even know what a typewriter is. But it was 
I mean, that's essentially, if you're wondering, this is a screenshot of his nightmare, and that's sort of what a typewriter looks like right there. <laughs> if, if you don't know, Google it. That's what Google's for. Well, he was totally freaking out over being trapped there like Arthur was. And it was very funny, but I think it also makes a lot of sense to me. You see, Dan, if the tick is the symbol of destiny, stepping in to take Arthur down paths unknown, the office job Arthur would have been trapped in is most definitely his worst nightmare. What are your thoughts on this? I think it brings uh, um, an idea that um, I hadn't really thought about that quite possibly the tick is the manifestation of his destiny. And if that destiny was to change, he might be trapped where Arthur's life would have been. Wow. Wow. See, it just comes full circle. <laughs> it does, because like, from the very beginning, he steps in to be the path of destiny, opening the door for Arthur. And then you're right. If he was trapped in this nightmare, he, he wouldn't be the path for Arthur. He wouldn't be able to be that for him. Chat friends, feel free to chime in too. Let's see what's happening in the chat real quick. We have some more comments. Uh, Eric Grant says, Sadly, I can't stay. I'll watch the replay. Take care, everyone. Well, thank you for being here, Eric. It's good to see you. Julian yes, Murray you, says... Sorry about that. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just saying uh, uh, thanks, Eric, for stopping by. <laughs> I just... I ramble. <laughs> I have to, like, slow down. <laughs> Julian Murray says, can't have enough Jiggy. Very true. Mr. B-Man says, love hearing your views and insight. Well, thank you, Mr. B-Man. I think I said two names at the same time, but Mr. B-Man says, love hearing your, your views and insight. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Edgen says, right on, Julian. <laughs> they love Jiggy. It's, it's nice. I'm, I'm glad. Jiggy loves you, too. Tack the Artist ca uh, Cat says, so many comments. That is, that is true. There are a lot of comments here, and feel free to keep commenting. We love the conversation. That's what it's all about. So that's and Tick's that's, Nightmare. Uh just wanted to comment real quick about the comments in the chat. It's so wonderful to see so many people actively involved in the comment section. I've been on uh, a few shows or a few streams here and there, and uh, it's really, really uh, heartwarming to, to feel that interaction with uh, the viewers, you know, that, uh, that, that they they're involved with the uh, conversations and you're just not uh, talking to a camera. So, you know, it, for me, it's good. For me, it's good. And I think it's good for you, too, as well, I hope. Oh, yeah. Right on. That's uh, Like I said, that's what it's all about. You are the commotion of Cartoon Commotion. Without you, there'd be no commotion. So what show do we have? Come on. <laughs> and speaking of that, we got another comment. Tack the Artist Cat says, what is your favorite episode of The Tick? Okay, so, Dan, I'll let you go first. Ooh, that's, uh, that's kind of a tough one there. Uh, it, it's so hard to choose which one it might be. Uh, but I, I think, I think we'd have to go. Um, I, I love, uh, you know, the, the throwback episode two, Tick versus chair face Chippendale. Um, you know, I, I, I was young enough to remember, uh, as well as Ben, Ben Edlin, the original, um, Dick Tracy comics with his rogues gallery of, of misfigured villains. And, uh, I loved the the whole idea of of his scheme was just to write his name on the moon, and you know he didn't get a get a chance to, so it just said cha on the side of the moon. But you know the cool thing about that was that it remained consistent both in the comic and in the cartoon. Yeah, I mean, they, like, okay, so you got to understand, guys. Ben Edlin was a part of the writing staff of this cartoon as well. He didn't just hand it off to someone else. He made sure that it was very faithful to the original material, as faithful as it possibly could be, while also being kid safe, and you know, mm -hmm. appropriate for all ages. And yes. the, I, I'm right on screen. Here's that rogues gallery. Here's some of them just laughing in the in the um, house of Chair Chippendale, Chair Face Chippendale, and. He did write Cha on the moon, and in every episode featuring the moon afterwards, you see the word Cha. <laughs> Which gave me a giggle every single time. <laughs> I know, because it's just, it's it reminds you of when he did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And here he is sitting in his chair <laughs> um, 
this was probably the most unusual villain I think of the show um because like I mean he's got a chair for a head <laughs> hey you know so many questions come through my mind like how does he eat um does he does he have a nose to blow um would that top of the chair be considered hair like I mean does he how have does he see does he get termites <laughs> So many questions that I wish I didn't think about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sherry Etchen coming in says, you both are so knowledgeable about the tick has helped me understand it more. That's what I love about cartoon commotion with awesome guests like Dan. Thank you for all your insight. That is a wonderful comment. Thank you so much. I think Sherry Edgen is winning the comment section tonight. <laughs> Julian, <laughs> Julian, I'm looking at you. You gotta, you gotta get in here, man. Get in here and start commenting more. Come on. You said one thing. You got a lot of competition. <laughs> He's my friend in real life. We can do that. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, real quick, let's wrap up this arc. Specifically, uh, this arc in particular, because there's like multiple things that happen throughout the show, but. The arc of Arthur hugging his destiny and embracing an original path. So, Dan, I did not ask you to watch episode five, but I got there. I, get, I went further, of course, than, than the homework that I gave you. Um, but in episode You're talking five, about the breadmaster. Oh, no. Okay, so I'm thinking of episode... No, I saw that too, but it was actually episode six. Oh, El Seed. That's the one. El Seed. <laughs> Arthur and Tick at the end of the episode, are riding in a crop duster to stop an army of mutated corn stalks from invading the city. It's a long story. you got to watch the episode to understand it. Um, but at the cusp of the victory, Arthur shouts out, and here's a screenshot of him raising his arms up to the sky, and he says that he loves being a superhero, which is actually the first time in the series that he said such a thing. Like, the entire phrase... I love being a superhero. And then the tick turns around from flying the plane <laughs> to tell him in a rather recklessly way that he knew that he would. I, do you remember <laughs> this situation, Dan? Uh, I'm not as up on it as you are. It, it, I didn't quite uh, get to that particular one. So, But uh, I, I do, uh, I think I remember the, the Civic Minded Five. Uh, that uh, yep, that's true. With. <laughs> they did the uh, Civic Minded Five. Oh goodness, were they like a parody? What what team were they a parody of? Because I saw it as like you know like a Super Friends mock sort of, or like almost Spider Man and his Amazing Friends mock. Because like they do that whole go for it thing, but instead of saying go for it, they say um, let's do it or something like that. It's just it's a very basic battle cry, and then they go off to fight mutant armies of play in the last bit when they get to the cornfield they don't even bother getting out of their station wagon they're just like they're just like now not we can't do this <laughs> they they get out of there so okay so that's that's not the moment the moment that i'm speaking of is literally the end where they're in this crop duster and arthur says that line is specifically uh i love being a superhero and the tick says i knew you would and I feel like that, Dan, is the culmination, the finish of this arc. Do you see that? Yes, very much so. It's because like it's, the it's an affirmation. Top. You know, that's that's something the tick has been saying to him the entire time, uh, from telling him that uh, he's going sane in an insane world. Uh, you know, to to that particular moment there. Uh, the tick has been behind him 100% as it, you know, and, and that right there is just affirming that he's always known that Arthur had it in him from the moment he landed right in front of him. I like to see it a lot like the self-acceptance moment where it's like he, he's been, you know, like you just said, that reaffirming, like he knows, but he had to admit it. He had to like... He had to get to that point to where he realized like this was the life for him. It wasn't just a crazy dream. It's something that he's seeing fulfilled. It's kind of like when you publish like your first comic, like like in your case. Like when you get that out there, it's like it's no longer just a crazy dream. It's a reality. You're making it yes. happen. 
So this was Arthur's moment of self-acceptance and, you know, taking that, you know, to the next level by saying, uh, by accepting who he was as a person, not just, not just saying it, not just saying, like, putting himself out there and saying, I'm, I'm going to be this, but that is where it really clicked. Uh, I am really amazed that there was such character growth with Arthur because, you know, it's not expected in a superhero comedy. This is a show that was, you know, it's a satire, it, but it delivered on that. And it acts kind of like an actual introspection tool among the mess of ridicul ridiculousness that even though it seems like you're crazy in the pursuit of this dream that you have, you might just be going sane in a crazy world. You know, one of the things, if I could just interject really quickly, Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that Ben would do when writing The Tick uh, in comic book form is comment, use the comic book to comment on current situations that he had with uh, with dealing with the, the bigger companies, the toy companies, the branding companies, the uh, animation houses, if you will, as well. Um, he didn't really enjoy all of that as much as he did coming up and writing the stories uh, that were there to be uh, licensed out. So it's quite possible that what we see here is the is the introspection or inter uh, in soul searching, if you will, soul searching of it's Ben. It's okay. I flub my words and, all the time. <laughs> uh, writing out on pen and paper or or typewriter, if he had one back then, um, had one. his experience in actually overcoming everything and being the person that he wanted to be and making the show that he wanted to make and finally succeeding at doing everything the way he wanted to, what he wanted to do and the way he wanted to. Because just like Arthur, he fought the uphill battle. Uh, he did it his way. And he was the one responsible for everything that happened after that. That life of destiny and adventure was far more exciting than taxes. And I could not agree with you more, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just like when the whole world, when it feels like the world is saying like, that's insane. Sometimes, yes, it's, it's insane, but that's what you feel called to. That's the direction you're, you're destined for. And so this is like, you know, like you said, him being introspective and, and I feel I feel that in the cartoon. I feel like in the comic it was well represented, but in the cartoon you got to follow it on a more mm, a, a sort of uh, long term basis. You got to follow it with progression. Uh, we have a few more comments. Julian Murray says, "I have taken it upon myself to win the comment war." Good for you, Julian. You have thirty minutes. John B. Pikes says, checking in for my ghost tour. Thank you for being here, John. Johnny is the leader of our uh, network. Mr. B-Man says, what action figures do either of you have from the tick? That's a good question. Do you have any, Dan? I actually do not have any action figures <gasps> from the tick. Um, but I do have uh, plenty of gifted action figures on the wall that uh, people have given me over the years. Uh, from Flash Gordon to Ash versus the Evil Dead, uh, some things I'll talk about on my my stream <laughs> at some point. But uh, I happen to be holding in my hand the one thing that I kind of fidget with when I uh, doesn't focus. But you know who this guy is without yep. saying his name. Is uh, that Dark Knight Batman? Dark Knight. It Returns, is. This or... is, this one came with the DVD for uh, the Dark Knight Returns. So it's a similar build. To the tip yes. a little bit. A little bit. A little Very bit, much the so. same bulk going on there. Maybe with the muscles. Maybe I'll take it and uh, uh paint him and reskin him and and uh <laughs> you can custom tick. <laughs> I'll custom the tick because the chin sticks out a little bit there. Well, it's a good <laughs> it's a good fit. It's a, you know, just gotta yeah, you take some modeling clay and sculpt that thing. Um so Sherry Edgen comes back here and says, Well, you know, if evil is afoot and you have no arms, you have to use your head. <laughs> yeah, I remember that was uh, the episode where they, they had to, the villain had, I don't remember, it was some sort of piece of tech that could remove their arms from their bodies without actually 
cutting them off. And <laughs> I, I don't I don't know why they wanted the I forget, but that was season two. Um, definitely something I have to revisit now. Julian Murray comes in here. Hi, Julian. Uh, dumb old taxes. <laughs> Still trying to win the comment awards. It's coming up on the end here, bud. Tack the Artist Cat says, I am still here. Good to know. We we love you. <laughs> so we we can confirm the tick, as we see it, is the manifestation of Arthur's destiny, and the show is technically about Arthur accepting his destiny in the pursuit of an unconventional path. Okay. Uh, chat friends, if you're still here, thank you for being such a fine part of this show. You are the commotion in Cartoon Commotion, and we love having you here. Tack the Artist Cat, Julian Murray, Cherry Edgen, Mr. Beam Man, John B. Pika, Julian Murray's back again, <laughs> Eric Grant, and many others. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, you are the commotion of Cartoon Commotion. Without you, we would have none of that. Dan, thanks bunches for joining us. Before we wrap things up, could you share a bit of what it is that you do and let peoples know where they can find and support your work? Well, if you uh, look at my name uh, on the screen, you will see the address of comics.rosalisentertainment.com. And that is where I am selling a graphic novel version of a comic book that I wrote that was uh, digitally released through uh, globalcomics.com last year. It's called My Frankenstein. It's not necessarily for the kids, but it's a <laughs> retelling of the Frankenstein story through a superhero lens. So what it basically does is sets up an entire superhero universe that from this point on, after that story, will move forward. And um, it lays out uh, the way that it actually sets up the entire superhero universe uh i'm giving away not giving away but i am i've i've got ready uh 50 uh comic books that will be shipped out signed and numbered so they'll come, in, they'll, they'll, they'll come in this little clamshell box here and uh, you'll have a little sticker there that says thank you and this is an example of the comic book right here it's 72 pages, uh, full color. It's got a little thank you note inside there. It's fully bagged, and it's got a card in there, uh, acid-free for your protection. And somewhere on the page, somewhere on the cover, I will sign it and number it and send it out to you first-class mail in the USA. So that's what's going on right now. Nice. That's what I'm selling. And uh, I think I've got it uh, set up for $21.99. Uh, hmm. For the first fifty, so it's a it's a good price, I think, for uh, what, what you're getting. So that's that's what we're doing. That is very true, and I know from experience that making comics is expensive. So everyone, this is definitely worth the money. He's not he, he's cutting prices. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, remember, everyone, if you haven't already, I encourage you to go back through our older episodes. We have a couple out now. Wherever you get podcasts. Even if it's a show or, you know, a cartoon that you wouldn't consider yourself nostalgic for, I'm confident that you will be amazed but what, by what we present. So check those out if you'd like to. If you have the time, please check those out. And thanks again for being here. Keep it unreal, Commotion Crew. Before you go jumping over to some other piece of content out there, if you really enjoyed this podcast, please share it with a friend, or even someone you'd barely consider a friend, or perhaps someone you'd rather not be friends with. Just share it with anyone who might enjoy it, because friend, you were a part of this. You put the commotion in Cartoon Commotion. Much like our Patreon supporters, Eric Grant, Marsha Sullivan, Carrie Cube, Cade Utterback, and Toystalker.com. And just in case you forgot, in the last 60 minutes, this show is brought to you by the fine folks at the Serial Box Network, SerialBoxNetwork.com. Again, all I ask 
for your time here is a quick like and share to your social media platform of choice. There's literally a share button on everything. It doesn't take longer than 20 seconds, and every bit helps get the word out about this podcast. Now then, play us out, Jiggy. Thank <laughs> you.